Advanced Principles Podcast, or APP, was created to be an outlet for like-minded individuals to share in the broader conversations on leadership, retail market updates, and incredible personal success stories. On APP, you will hear a collection of stories from the titans of the retail industry, as well as thought and practice leaders covering the spectrum of the economy. Please click the subscribe button and look for the newest episodes to be released. Here's what's selling the fastest. Here's what's selling for the most profit. Let's let's kind of set the matrix around that. And they can have a predefined profit margin built in. It's nice to have all those options right in your own backyard. That the Carvanas and the Rubens and the Carmaxes of the world are doing it today. We're providing that instant offer. So when you were first looking at that PowerPoint and Bruce was showing it to you, um, we're in a very different world than when you first saw those slides. Oh my gosh. Um, it worked then. It made sense to you. And I'm sure at that point you were putting on your private, your investment banker cap and kind of looking at it from a due diligence standpoint. Yep. But now the world has flipped uh, from, you know, the supply chain issues, um, the used car inventory and the valuations that they're seeing. Um, timing is a, is a lot of things, but you had the right program at the right time that was built for dealers to be successful on. How much has the last 18 months of pandemic driven supply chain issues aided in car offers growth? That's a good question. I think that, um, you know, I think that we would be well positioned without it is what I would say. Um, that said, I think what it did help us do is dealers, you know, when you try a car offer, there's a certain degree of trust that you have to put into the organization to just go, hey, this is completely foreign to me, right? The, the concept of ordering a used car, as an example, right? I mean, that sounds really, really foreign to a used car manager. So you do have to have some degree of trust that you place in the organization that you're going to do business with. Um, but I think that supply chain shortage, what it did do was it pushed dealers to go like, okay, hey, I've got to take some risk on here. And I'm going to try something that I maybe previously wouldn't have been comfortable with. And then once they tried it, they were hooked. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. that's been the really neat thing. I, I think we'd still be well positioned because there was there were inventory challenges and still finding the right car for your store is, was critical then. And we, I think we do a really phenomenal job of making that happen as well. But it's, it's hard to deny the fact that people had to give something else a shot. And we were there and, uh, and, and winning people over as a result. Yeah, yeah. I know when I was in retail, uh, you'd get that one customer that would come in and they wanted this sp very specific pre-owned car, mileage, color, equipment, option, everything. And it's like, you know, we used to joke around and say, well, yeah, great. Let me just call the used car factory and see if we can get you one made. And when right. I first learned of car offer and went through the demo and started asking my questions, I'm like, you guys built a used car factory. I mean, this thing is really just kind of a made to order pre-owned okay. auto outlet. Um, and I know when we first started approaching dealers to it, we kind of told that same story and everyone heard of the used car factory because we all came up through retail and dealers were very willing to jump on board. Like you said, you had a viable product, a viable solution. Pandemic aside, dealers wanted a more effective and efficient way to acquire inventory for their lot. And you guys do a great job because you, su you supply some back-end protection to the dealer as well. If they're going to take a flyer on a car, they know they're not just walking out on the type by themselves. You guys offer some level of protection in there. Where was that in the developmental stage from the early days? Did that come after the fact, after some dealer feedback, or was that always part of it day one? So uh, there was the the original product that we carried was was the forty five day guarantee. We still have it. Um, it's still very much a, a, a good product for us, but that is more of an a la carte selection where a dealer can buy. Uh, think about think like a put option in the stock market, right? The right to sell a vehicle in forty five days at a uh, predetermined price. And so in, in exchange for, for providing that product, you pay a fee up front, and then if you choose to transact, pay a sell fee at the end, and regardless of what the market's done. And so uh, that was a product day one, but the, the offer guard product was really, a, was really a surprise in terms of, um, not a surprise that we, we, we built it, but meaning just how quickly it caught on and how popular it is now. So uh, dealers, there was that interest in, in sort of that deal shield like product where dealers had an instant exit strategy and or a 45 day exit strategy on the cars they bought and it was purchased automatically. And so um, it also helped dealers give, get that same level of comfort that they felt from buying at traditional auctions um, through our platform. 
And so it probably came, I guess, Ryan, probably six, seven months in is what okay. I said. And it was, um, it was something we had talked about months prior, just hadn't really made the strategic decision to do it. But once we did, I mean, it's adoption is incredible. I mean, it's, yeah. been, it's been really great. And it's very, very popular today. Yeah, that's very good. Very good. Now, from when I first saw the program, I know that it's made um, several evolutions and just minor enhancements, some bigger ones, some smaller ones off regard were certainly uh, brought on board. And, and we love that option for our dealers. What are some of the other things that have changed along the way and how has that benefited the dealers? So one of the things that we're most proud of is, is a result of our partnership with Car Gurus, um, our merger, merger with Car Gurus, I should say. Um, and that is the, the access to their retail data. And so what I mean by that, uh, retail listings data. So the Car Gurus maintain, maintains their pricing algorithm. Think they're, you know, they call it instant market value. Um, it's the same algorithm that determines whether or not a car that's on one of their sites is listed at a at a great deal, a good deal, mm -hmm. fair deal, um, so on and so forth. And so, uh, you know, when you think about first, that number is phenomenal. They've got a traditional, I mean, they've got a fantastic, um, you know, data team that has done really, really incredible work to make that number very, very reliable. And so, and it's, it's in line with what the dealers are used to using to set their retail prices with, uh, with tools like Auto and others. And so um, getting access to that instant market value number, as well as their, as th those retail numbers on a bin specific basis was, was wow. really a good move for us um, because now a dealer can make offers on our platform in an automated fashion. Um, it's based on a retail number, on a retail price that's unique to their zip code and they can have a predefined profit margin built in. So after that car gets put on a truck, they pay their fee, they pay their inspection. It comes to your lot, and I've got I've got in that um, in my offer baked in my profit margin. It's hard to have that level of discipline uh, at a traditional that is a traditional yeah. our traditional platform. So that's been a game changer for us for sure. Um, and the fact that it's that it's tied to your unique zip code. I think is it's hard to be. It's really yeah, be. yeah, and the, the cars sell for different values all across the country. I know uh, the dealers that we have on it from coast to coast. One, they like the access because it really opens up from their regional auction, or they're not flying to auctions, so they they get access to uh, vehicles. Obviously, trucks are very popular in Texas, so we have a few dealers down in Texas that love buying trucks not out of Texas because they're not competing with all the other Texas right. dealers. And um, certainly us being up here in the Rust Belt, we have a lot of people that like to buy vehicles from the Southern states, so they don't have those first couple of years of exposure. So I think offering up that playbook, and then now what you've done with car gurus and making it so specific to their market from a retail standpoint, because that lifted diesel one ton single axle truck is gonna be worth a very different retail amount in East Texas than it is in Northern Ohio. And awesome. uh, I think that the value that you're bringing to the dealers there is exceptional. So great job continuing to push that envelope forward. You. And, you know, acquiring inventory from the dealer network that you have established is pretty extraordinary. But I think you're working on some things for dealers to access inventory other ways as well. What yeah. are some of the things that you're working on? Yeah, so we, um, we're actually past the working on the stage. We're doing it. So that's what's really cool. We are so now you can um, go on to cargurus.com as a consumer and uh, right on the main page, you'll see a banner. It's about halfway down the page to sell my car or at the top, there's a, there's a few little places you can access where it'll say sell or sell my car, but you can, in essence, um, plug your VIN in, answer some questions about the options that your vehicle has, answer some questions about the condition, it takes about a minute um, and get an, get an instant offer to sell your car today. Um, through cargurus.com. And so just the same way that the Carvanas and the Brooms and the CarMaxes of the world are doing it today, we're providing that instant offer and we're buying cars directly from consumers. We handle uh, the processing of you know, payoffs. We handle wow. titles, consumer interaction. We even pick up the car today from the consumer's home and um, we're dropping it off in a local market at a dealer that's participating on our platform, what we call a, a nearby participating landed dealer. Okay. And so, and that's where I think it gets really neat, Ryan, is that landed dealer, in essence, what they have is they get a look at the car. 
So they have a 48 hour right of first refusal to where they get to, they can touch the car, feel the car, smell the car, walk around it, you know, throw it on a lift, drive it. We don't care as long as it stays in one piece. Right. And, uh, and they get 48 hours to decide if they want to buy that car, if they want to pass it and they can buy it for obviously the price that it's a, that uh, is available in the system uh, plus a buy fee. So it has been, it has been really, really cool. We're now live in about half the country. Okay. Approximately half the country. And so, um, and it is, it, it is just incredibly popular and we're already seeing big, big volume. Uh, wow. Which is, which is really exciting. That's extraordinary. That's yeah. just fantastic. And, um, you know, inventory acquisition is one thing, and it certainly is critical right now as dealers are struggling to maintain some level of inventory to keep their volume up. But wholesaling, really, the amount of wholesaling that goes on through the platform surprised me a little bit. I thought dealers would use it primarily, maybe 90-10 acquisition versus wholesaling. But I have story after story after story, and I'm sure you have hundreds more than I do, of dealers having all kinds of success on the wholesale side. So are you seeing the same thing across the broader platform? Yeah, there, there seems to be this trend that it's uh, it's the wholesale as a profit center trend, where I would say if you ask the typical franchise dealer three to four years ago, hey, uh, you know, what's your wholesale strategy? It's almost a dirty word, right? The wholesale mm -hmm. wholesale profit was, was, uh, was almost a four-letter word, right? Where the objective was to spend as much as you could for trades, right? To increase your likelihood of getting that car, but ultimately helping you sell that new car, right? To keep that yep. engine moving, which I don't think is a bad strategy by any means. But um, the challenge that that exists today is that there just aren't those new cars to get trades, right? And mm -hmm. so dealers have had to get creative and find ways to make money and wholesale is one of those ways. And so I could tell you, just to your point earlier, I could tell you 50 stories of dealers that have now opened uh, you know, separate separate departments, things like that, that they're buying cars off the street. They're, they're you know, buying lease returns and flipping them. They're doing all kinds of stuff to um, to sort of make make ends meet and, and make the, uh, you know, make the financial statement look good. So to yeah. Speak, yeah, it all it all has to work. And uh, for you to provide them outlets to one, acquire inventory, but then also wholesale, if that's the right decision for them at that particular time, I think it's a fantastic option to have available. Mm -hmm. And uh, you guys do it really well. So, you know, talk a little bit about how you went into the program. One is um, when I first saw it, kind of like you, maybe the light bulb didn't click as as quickly, but it was like, this is a no brainer. This is this is just it's an easy decision to endorse this program and introduce our dealers to it. Um, part of it was is that it's easy. You know, you trade cars like stocks and you right. set up the buying matrix and you kind of go through there was easy always an aspect of it and how hard is that to continue providing easy as you're adding the complexities of, you know, consumer inventory acquisition, now wholesale acquisition, the offer guard, the 45 day here, you've added a lot of complexity and still made it pretty mm -hmm. easy. How hard has that been? Um, it is, it is difficult, no doubt. So it, it sounds, it sounds funny, but, um, and it is a core strategy of ours to make this process simple. Um, the simpler we can keep it, the better, right? I mean, obviously the product in and of itself, you start to have these unraveling conversations about the complexities, right? And we want it to be that way to where at the at the core of what we're doing, we're buying and selling cars, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that has absolutely been a strategy from day one. I will say it probably hasn't been the only and maybe not even the primary strategy in the beginning. And so we really wanted to be and we and we and we have these types of relationships today. I think we've done a really nice job of it. Uh, these consultative partners with dealers as well, to where we look at we don't just use these blanket statements like "oh, I don't wholesale any of my retail inventory." Rather than saying things like that, we actually we actually think strategically about the inventory that we have in our in our at our dealership, as an example, and and uh, and go, okay, maybe maybe this car is not a part of my core inventory. Maybe this is one that I'd rather sell. This car that's aged on me, it's 90, 100 days old. It's tying up $30,000 of my money. And instead, I want to take that $30,000, invest it in a car that's going to turn three times in the same time period, right? And I can order yeah, that automatically yeah. with the buying matrix. And so all of a sudden, we're getting rid of the stuff that doesn't perform at my store. And oh, by the way, when we get rid of it, we, we get a good aggressive number from car offer. But then we're filling my store, uh, my inventory backup with the cars that are going to perform best. 
Yeah. And so we do a lot of really cool things with DMS integrations, among other things, to where, you know, we're looking at a dealership's top performers, um, think the cars that they make the most profit on, on average, and that they turn the quickest, help them buy more of those cars, stock to an optimal supply of those types of cars, meanwhile, getting rid of the cars that, from a statistical standpoint, are likely to age. We, um, I would tell you, we saw ourselves as a data company in that sense. We wanted to be, mm-hmm. we wanted to provide really good data that dealers can make really good sound decisions with. And then, oh, by the way, have some fun selling and buying some cars too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I know from the onboarding process, when a dealer sees the demo, they get it, they get excited because of, uh, it's just a cool technology to be walked through. Um, and then when they go through that initial onboarding and set up their matrix, the amount of input that you provide them, and I would say guidance, um, kind of that consultative approach, like you said, is, you know, here's what are here's what's selling the fastest, here's what's selling for the most profit. Let's let's kind of set the matrix around that. Where's dealers' kind of appetite for that, and how accepting are they of a total stranger's advice on how they should be retailing cars? And you know, to be fair, a lot of these people they've been doing it for. 20, 30, 40 years, going to the auction, buying cars. Everyone thinks they're the best used car person in the universe. And how welcoming are are your consultants' advice into that conversation? I'll say most most dealers are very smart. And they they want to, at the end of the day, just understand something Mm -hmm. that's smart. And so I would actually argue that um, because of some of the approaches that we take, that most dealers are fairly open-minded in that regard and fairly accepting. Um, now we try to be as transparent as possible. Mm-hmm. And so that is the key. Uh, you know, you've got this thing that's a bit of a mystery in a dealer's mind, especially if they haven't used it. And so we need to be able to provide as much data as possible up front so that they can kind of see the behind the scenes of the platform. And so we have some ways of doing that, some different reporting. And, and I will tell you, um, you know, we've got guys in the beginning, they were very how do I say this? Uh, skeptical, I guess, of, of car offer and the team. And but now we've got guys that out here on our on what we call our trade floor, which is our team of account managers that have great relationships with these dealers. And they're talking two times a week. And it's not like a five minute phone call. It's like an hour long consultative phone wow. call. They're, they're digging through inventory. They're they're talking about the buying strategy. They're sharing data. They're talking about the fishing trip they had this weekend. They're talking about going camping with their son. Like, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, but it's, it's exactly what we wanted and it's really cool to see it, to see it play out. Yeah. And yeah. kudos to the dealers for being, I mean, I will tell you, dealers have been incredibly open-minded as long as you're transparent. Yep. And I think that that's key. And, and you're definitely very transparent. You open up the whole playbook. Um, I think dealers are encouraged to get into their, into the matrix and play around with it a little bit, but in a very comfortable manner. Mm-hmm. Um, to where they're not being pushed to, hey, go out and buy 30 pieces of inventory. Let's just take a flyer on it. Whereas um, the trade advisors are really working through that with them. And I think the trade advisors have been a big key to the success, having that connectivity. And like you said, going from here's how we're going to set up your matrix. I'm going to show you a bunch of really cool data and maybe even overwhelm you a little bit at the beginning to six months from now, we're going to be talking about you taking your grandkids fishing, uh, like you right. said. And I think that that trust, um, becoming that trusted advisor is what most of us as providers seek. And it seems like you've really expedited that process. Yeah, at the end of the day, dealers just want partners, right? They, just like we do, we want um, we want partners that want to do business with us for a long time. So do they. They want someone yep. that's going to treat them right. When they've got an issue, you know, they call them. Uh, I always say this line, My uh, I had an old boss that said, you know, not all cars at the auction are bad, but all bad cars are at the auction, right? <laughs> so we're not an auction, but we are a place to get cars, no doubt. And so um, problem cars get traded on every platform, right? Yep. And so, but a dealer wants to know that when I have an issue, that it, that I am well taken care of, that I'm the, I'm the priority, um, that my issue is resolved in a timely manner and in a fair way. And so, um, and that's what really cements those relationships too. Um, yeah, it's just that type of dynamic between us. And I may or may not have been a uh, party to several of you, several of those incidents where you guys have had to step in because of that unusual sure. circumstance. And you guys have absolutely stepped up on each and every single occasion and taken care of the dealer and done what's right by Good. every page of the playbook. So, you know, thank you for that. And all of our dealers really appreciate it. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yep. Don't have any other way. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as we go forward, um, kind of where, 
What's the outlook look like? Obviously, you've had, I think, you know, record month after record month, and maybe you can talk to kind of where you're at right now. Um, the world continues to evolve. I think we're in our current cycle, you know, somewhere between six to 18 months from a, a supply chain issue. Um, so what, what's kind of the next 24, 36 months look like for car offer? Yeah, um, so we are, we're at approximately 7,000 rooftops today. And wow. so we, we still see a lot of growth ahead of us. And so, which is really exciting to already see what the network and the platform is doing with, um, with still only a fraction of, of, the, of the dealer base on it. So we see a tremendous amount of growth there. Um, and I think that the, the demand from the dealer level is, is not gonna slow down anytime mm -hmm. soon. In fact, it might get worse. So, um, uh, because from everything we're hearing, whether it's from the fleet companies or from um, you know, the, uh, the, the OEMs or, or just even franchise dealers that are talking to the, their, their OEM partners, we're looking at two two years before this thing really even starts to see any movement. In the wow. um, and then not to mention all the uh, logistical challenges that are going to come with once once we are able to start producing cars um, at this at the same rate that we were um, getting getting dealer stock back to its normal levels and then uh, and then getting getting that process rolling. There are challenges that come with that as well. So. Um, Car offer is is a great solution for for this time and then also beyond that though I think mm -hmm. I think we're really well positioned in that regard and I think what excites me the most and we're hearing it over and over and over again it's like hey this is a permanent part of my business now yep you know car offer is something that I just I can't live without now I need mm -hmm. these cars every single month you know my twenty my twenty five my thirty car offer cars. Um, I know for several of our dealers, if we tried to take it away from them now, I think we'd have a revolt. Uh, they absolutely, they absolutely loved it. There's a couple of people they get in there every morning, they tweak their matrix a little bit. Oh, yeah. There's some that just kind of set it and forget it and visit it weekly. Um, but if we went in and said, "No, you can't have that anymore," I, I, I think they had to absolutely revolt against us. So you guys have done sure. an amazing job providing that stickiness, which is what we all seek in the relationship aspect of it. Well, I love it. You know, we it's it's a true marketplace and it's 24 hours a day. Right. So I've had a couple of times where I've gotten off an airplane, you know, at four in the morning and I'm just I hop in there to see what's going on. And there's there are act, there's activity. Oh, I mean, wow. there are transactions happening and which is just really, really, really cool. Yeah, that is really cool. So it's been fascinating learning a little bit more about your journey, how you got into retail. Um, the success that you had there and certainly the car offer journey. I think there's, we told a portion of the story. There's a lot more to be told. So we'll probably have you on again in the future to kind of give, okay. provide some updates. I think it's a great story in our industry. Um, I love the success that's happening. I love that it's built, to, it's very dealer centric, which, all, you know, it seems that successful programs have to be dealer centric. The dealer has to have that value. They have to find a way to win. And certainly on your platform, they are because they're either acquiring much needed inventory or they're wholesaling as an additional profit center in a world that they didn't used to be able to, um, which does that. So thank you very much for your time. We're going to end with our fast five. So I'm going to ask you five questions, totally unscripted. Okay. Throw you some curveballs here and have a little bit of fun in it. And uh, you are a Texan. I know you went to school in Texas. Were you born and raised Texan? I was. Dallas. Okay. Texas. There you go. So that uh, makes some of the questions even better. So you're an alumni of SMU, um, yes. which a lot of people know of uh, for the notorious death penalty that was handed sure. down before your time. Um, but they also have some very famous alumni, a uh, former first lady. Um, yep. There is a media mogul that went through school there, a couple of NFL owners, if I read correctly. Yep. Um, yep. I'm, a, I'm an avid golfer. Um, there's two very famous golfers that have come out of SMU. Do you happen to know who they are? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Bryson DeChambeau. Right. Yep. And uh, who was the other, who am I missing? Uh, I don't know the second one. Who is the second one? Payne Stewart. Payne Stewart, of course. Yeah. Yep. I, I did. Yep. I, yeah. Yep. Payne Stewart. So a uh, very impressive list of alumni that you are associated yeah. with. That's a very cool circle to be involved in. Um, so in and out landed in Texas about 10 years ago, and I couldn't believe yeah. when I looked it up for this, that it's already That's been 10 years, years since oh they first God. opened their location in Texas. So I'm a big in and out fan. Um, uh, when I lived out West, I was in a state that didn't have it. And we always loved to be able to travel to states that had it. We'd go and get our in and out. So being a Texan, in and out or Whataburger? Oh, Whataburger. <laughs> not even, not even close, by the way. It's amazing. <laughs> I, it's got to be like a 90-10. If you're if you're a native Texan, 
it's Whataburger. If you're oh. a transplant from California, as there are many now, it's uh-huh. in and out. Yeah, it's uh, it's not even close. I will tell you, I do like uh, an animal style burger every once in a while, but uh, but Whataburger, Whataburger beats that one hands down. Whataburger is it? It's uh, I think all you Texans get together and tell that same story. I love it. <laughs> so um, top vacation spot in Texas, um, which has Texas has many many vacation spots: um, Hill Country, South Padre, or a quiet lake in East Texas. We're hill country people. We like to go, okay. we actually do it uh, once a year. We try to once a year, I should say. And we love it. I, uh, I've i got some family that actually grew up in the Wimberley area in Texas, which is beautiful. And so that's a really neat part of the country. But then uh, and we go to a little resort here with take the kids. And, oh, that's awesome. Uh, outside of San Antonio. So yeah, we love it. For- it's nice to have all those options right in your own backyard. Although oh, some yeah. of your backyard is 12 hours away, but it's still the yeah. Texas backyard. <laughs> no kidding. Um, so your preferred night out, um, shopping at the Galleria, hanging out at Billy Bob's in Fort Worth, or watching reruns of the triplets win the three Super Bowls in the 90s. Oh man, I'm a big cowboy fan. So I'd watch I'd watch reruns of the triplets <laughs> any day, just about. My wife would kill me if that was our date night, but uh, yep. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. And then the last one, and certainly we'll keep names out of it to keep the uh protect the innocent here, but the best accidental purchase story from your time at car offer Ooh, they nice. didn't mean to push that button they didn't know what it meant whatever mm-hmm. whatever the story was the best one that you've been involved in oh my gosh let me think about this we've had a few you know in the beginning i'll tell you we we had fun with some of the inspections right and so um i can remember i don't i can't tell you how many cars we've seen with eyelashes and purple that are purple with yellow wheels and all kinds of oh funny my goodness we're going. um yeah i would it, we, i can i'm thinking of a purple car with lime green hubcaps by the way not wheels but hubcaps that uh, it did not pass by the way folks it doesn't pass our inspection but, <laughs> but the dealer called us upset we in the early days we used to show the inspection to the dealer before it actually passed inspection and we stopped doing it because these types of things we sift all that stuff out right yeah, and we failed the inspection, and so, but these types of things were happening, and so uh, we had this guy call us, going like, "Shut my matrix off! I'm just, I don't ever want to buy." We're like, "No, no, no, sir, this won't pass our inspection. Don't worry about it." Wow, uh, unbelievable! Uh, sign me up for the purple one with the neon green wheels, and I definitely yeah. want eyelashes on the front of it. <laughs> I can't, I can't believe how many eyelashes there are for uh, on like beetles and things like that. Oh my gosh, unbelievable! Unbelievable. Well, Nick, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time today. Loved hearing more about you, your background, the connection to Sewell, and the journey that you're on at Car Offer. I know it's just the beginning. Um, you got years and years of success in front of you. The car guru thing is incredibly exciting. And from all of our dealers and reps that work with you guys on a regular basis, thank you for all that you've done throughout this pandemic to help them get inventory and keep their volume up uh, throughout these crazy times. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. We appreciate your organization uh, partnership and you guys have been wonderful and we've got lots of growth ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Nick. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Ryan. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. It's always great to learn about some of the fastest growing companies within the automotive industry from someone who has been there pretty much from the start. We hope everyone enjoyed listening to Nick talk about his different experiences and also a little more about Car Offer. Next week, we have a certified disc constructor and psychology consultant on App. You don't want to miss these next two episodes. You can find App on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and our website. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button.